The same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. Good evening, everyone. Um, and thank you, Stephen. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and it has been a pleasure over the past couple of days to be in the presence of the world future counselors who are here with us this weekend. Um, they're truly inspiring to me, and um, as you will all see very shortly, um, Judge Viramachi will hopefully inspire you all as he has me. Uh, I just wanted to quickly update everyone on some of the things that the foundation is doing. Um, we've got a lot of new programs for 2008 and a lot of exciting things happening. Uh, the first thing that Stephen did touch on briefly is our appeal to the next president. Uh, it's a sheet that looks like this. You can also sign it online. Uh, but there are sheets out uh, where we had the reception. Uh, please pick one up as you leave. Um, I just want to read a few of the, the points in this appeal, which is going to be uh, submitted to the next president uh, when he or she takes office in January 2009. We're asking for the U.S. to take leadership for a nuclear weapons-free world. Without the U.S. leading, we don't believe it's possible to get there. So there are seven steps that we want the next president to take, and they are to de-alert all nuclear weapons from their current high alert or hair trigger status. Uh, commit to no first use of these weapons. Uh, don't build any new ones. Ban nuclear testing. Control all nuclear material throughout the world. Negotiate a nuclear weapons convention. and shift our resources from war and nuclear weapons to peace. Yeah. We currently spend about $54 billion every year on nuclear weapons. <laughs> Many of you are going to pay your taxes on Tuesday. Uh, how much of that check that you're writing to the government goes to nuclear weapons? And is that where you would choose it to go if you could? We're asking the next president to put the priorities of this nation in line with, with what most people want, which is a peaceful and safe world for everyone. Uh, a couple other things that we're doing. We've got a new DVD. Uh, looks like this. Uh, it's called Nuclear Weapons and the Human Future. It's a 20-minute uh, presentation of our case against nuclear weapons. Uh, it was made, uh, it was written and narrated by our foundation's president, David Krieger. And it was made by two fantastic volunteers, um, Yvonne Van Wingerden, who is here with us this evening, and uh, his colleague, Ryan, Ryan Robertson. They did a great job, and they've, they've put hours and hours of hard work into this, and it's paid off. There he is. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, it's, it's been distributed in 109 countries and all 50 states uh, in just a couple of months. So this year is going to see further distribution and, uh, you know, hopefully it will help to educate thousands and tens of thousands of people on this very important issue. Um, we also have a lot of exciting things happening with our youth empowerment program. Uh, the Think Outside the Bomb is a group of students and young professionals from across the U.S. who work together toward a nuclear-free world. We just held a Think Outside the Bomb conference today in Washington, D.C., uh, organized by Nick Roth, our director in D.C. 
Uh, the event was covered by C-SPAN. It had a fantastic lineup of speakers. And, uh, you know, as always, the students who come to these events go on and do great things. Uh, Steve Storman, who is currently our Youth Empowerment Director, uh, if you could stand up and give everyone a wave, Steve. Steve is a veteran of our Think Outside the Bomb program. He has been involved in it from the beginning. And, you know, from, from a college student to now a college graduate, uh, he's, he's following his passion to continue the work uh, against nuclear weapons and to empower other young people to do the same. Um, let's see. A uh, couple other things. Uh, we hold a couple public events every year, such as this one. Uh, we have, we have honored numerous amazing people from all around the world, including President Arthur Robinson, who's, who's with us today. And just one final thing I wanted to mention, we have recently launched a new program called Santa Barbara, a Peace Community. And this program aims to bring 30 peace leaders together from all over Santa Barbara, volunteers, uh, like, like anyone in this room. For example, I think we have a few in this room, in fact. Um, and they come together, they're going to educate the community on not only the issues of, of nuclear weapons, but peace in general what peace means to them, and, and to create a consciousness throughout this city of peace. And, and we hope to transfer this, this program as a model to other communities as a way to, as a very grassroots way of, of spreading peace in the world. Peace leaders, I know you're out there. <laughs> Thank you very much. So that's it for me. Um, oh, I should mention, if you're interested, we're looking for more peace leaders. If you're from Santa Barbara and you'd like to hear more about this program and get involved, please talk to myself or Stephen, and uh, we'd be happy to uh, tell you a little more about it. So that's it for me. Uh, if, if you would like a copy of the DVD or more copies of The Appeal or have any questions about our programs, please do come and see me uh, at, at any time this night or just call the office and, and talk to me sometime. So uh, at this point, I just want to introduce the Foundation's president, David Krieger, who will say a few words. <clears throat> Well, I, I must say, I, I come up here after Stephen and Rick have spoken, and I feel very proud of the way the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation is developing. We've been, we've been working to abolish nuclear weapons, strengthen international law, and empower a new generation of peace leaders for the last 26 years. And uh, during that... <laughs> But as you heard from Stephen and Rick, uh, and I hope as you can feel as I do, uh, we're building a great team that uh, is, is going to do some amazing things and uh, continue to do some amazing things uh, related to the appeal, to the DVD, and to all the other projects that we're engaged in. Um, this this uh, weekend, uh, Rick mentioned that back in Washington, there's a Think Outside the Bomb conference that's been on C-SPAN. Uh, there's also an auxiliary project of the foundation. It has to do with the Western model United Nations, who are also meeting this weekend here in Santa Barbara. And what brings us together tonight is uh, the World Future Council 
being here in Santa Barbara for a meeting on future justice. And uh, you're going to hear a little more about that, but uh, the World Future Council is an amazing idea, I think. The, and the idea is that there needs to be some place, somewhere, some people who give voice to the needs of future generations. We can't go on living as we're, as we're living, uh, exploiting the earth, threaten each, threatening uh, each other with nuclear weapons, uh, using up the earth's resources, polluting. We can't just continue to live as we have been doing and expect that future generations will inherit a decent planet. And, in, and with some of the things we're doing, such as nuclear, hold, holding on to nuclear weapons for security, uh, we could foreclose the future uh, for future generations altogether. So the World Future Council uh, has a number of projects, but one of them is on future justice, and that's what we've been exploring this weekend. And I, I'd like to ask uh, all of the people who have come, the counselors of the World Future Council, the staff of the World Future Council, who have come here uh, to Santa Barbara to participate in this meeting to stand up and be recognized. I hope that uh, you've had a chance to meet some of these people and realize what uh, remarkable people they are and uh, what an honor it is to have them here. And I'd like to uh, call out just two of them for special recognition. Uh, the first is Jakob von Uxkel, who is the founder first of the Right Livelihood Awards and secondly of the World Future Council. He's a true visionary. Jakob, will you just stand, please? And a former recipient of the Foundation's uh, World Citizenship Award and the chair of the World Future Council, Bianca Jagger. I want to mention a uh, pamphlet that was prepared by a sister organization of ours, the International Network of Engineers and Scientists for Global Responsibility. There's some copies of this outside. It has several articles, uh, including one by Judge Vera Montre, and it was prepared for the Nonproliferation Treaty Preparatory Committee meeting uh, for the 2010 Nonproliferation Treaty Review Conference. The Preparatory Committee is going to take place uh, later this month in Geneva, and the foundation will be sending Rick Wayman, who you just heard from, and Nick Roth, our Washington, D.C. Uh, director, to participate in that meeting and to stand for the kinds of uh, uh, things that Rick read you on our petition. Not n The petition or the appeal is to the next president is about U.S. leadership, but all the nations of the world need to get on board on those seven policy issues that Rick read to you. And they'll be there uh, lobbying for those and uh, working for those with the delegates to that uh, preparatory committee meeting. Um, so now I'd like to turn to uh, our honored guest this evening, Judge Christopher Veramontri and tell you just a bit about him. He is a remarkable jurist and scholar. He's the author of 24 books. He's a former Supreme Court Justice uh, of the Sri Lankan Supreme Court. He's a former judge of the International Court of Justice, the highest court in the world. 
and he served as vice president of that court during his tenure. In 1996, the International Court of Justice uh, was asked to give an advisory opinion on the legality of the threat or use of nuclear weapons. The court, which has, uh, by tradition, judges, uh, 15 judges, but five of whom are from the, uh, the permanent members of the Security Council, who are also the original nuclear weapons states, uh, issued a ruling in which they said that the um, threat or use of nuclear weapons would be generally illegal, but under the current status of international law, it wasn't possible to say, one way or the other, whether it would be legal to use those weapons under the condition that the very survival of a state was at stake. Judge Veramontri took issue with the majority opinion in the court, and he wrote an, a dissenting opinion of about 80 to 100 pages, which said, essentially, there is no condition, none whatsoever, under which the threat or use of nuclear weapons could be considered legal. And for that, I think we owe him a great vote of thanks. <laughs> Judge Veramontri has been a professor of law at Monash University in Australia. Uh, in 1976, the bicennial uh, year of the United States, he came to the United States and it was asked to come to the United States to speak on freedom and equality, which he did and subsequently wrote a book on that subject. In 1996, the year of the uh, opinion on the illegality of the threat or use of nuclear weapons, it was also the 750th anniversary of the city of The Hague, where the court sits. And uh, The Hague uh, wanted to look at the, the great things that had been accomplished there, one of which was uh, its role in international law, which goes back a very long ways. And uh, they picked Judge Veramontri and his writings to represent uh, international law for the city of The Hague. <clears throat> In 2006, Judge Veramontri received the UNESCO Peace Education Award, and in 2007, he received the Right Livelihood Award, also known as the Alternative Nobel Prize, and he uh, received a special award, the highest award from Sri Lanka, which is uh, the Sri Lankan Pride of the Nation Award. And tonight, uh, I'm very pleased that the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation has the opportunity to present Judge Veramontri with our Lifetime Achievement Award. Judge Veramontri. David Krieger, <clears throat> members of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, members of the World Future Council, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me the greatest pleasure to be with you this evening and to share with you some ideas in relation to peace. The topic that has been given to me is international law, peace and future generations, and I would like to offer you a few thoughts on these all important topics. Now, as you would know, the ideal of peace has always been greatly sought after by all nations, all cultures, all civilizations. That has been their supreme objective to achieve peace. But throughout the ages, that has always evaded them. 
the philosophers, the religious teachers, the wise men of the time have always wanted it. But there has always been a gulf, a deep chasm, so to speak, between the world of philosophy and the world of power. Those who wield power in the world, they profess various things. They say they belong to this religion or that, that they are great lovers of peace and so forth. But what actually happens through their activities is what results in war. Now, why is this? We have got to try to find out the reason for it and therefore uh, try to, once we know the reason, to try to avoid the causes of war, prevent wars before they happen. Uh, trying to settle disputes after they have erupted into open hostilities is like applying uh, a bandage after the wound has been caused. But we must try to prevent the wound being caused. And to do that, we must analyze the causes of war. Now, the philosophers of peace throughout the ages have been doing this. In every culture, every civilization, there have been leaders who have taught their people how peace should be preserved. What are the causes of war? What should we do to have a peaceful world in the future for ourselves and especially for our children and our children's children? But that has been mainly daydreaming. It has never worked. And uh, therefore, organizations like the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation and the World Future Council are doing their best to alert the public uh, to do what they can. Because there is a common feeling that the individual can't do very much in these great issues of state. Now, that is not correct. Every individual can do something. And the cumulative weight of individual effort will gradually gather strength and achieve a massive momentum which even those in the corridors of power would have to respect. Now, this is what we are trying to do. And just reflect for a moment. Take all the great religions. Now, take Christianity. Christ said, my peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Christ is known as the Prince of Peace. But what do Christian states do? They go to war. Uh, Judaism, there is in Isaiah the famous statement, of turning swords into plowshares, and we shall not learn the art of war anymore. But what is happening? And then take Islam. Islam, by very definition, is the religion of peace, because it's derived from the Arabic word meaning peace. And Islam is full of teachings of peace, and still there is a great amount of war that comes, uh, that, 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 uh, uh, states and rulers are parties too. Now, Buddhism is essentially a religion of peace, and war under any circumstances would be outlawed in Buddhism. And in Hinduism, one of probably the most ancient of all the religions I've mentioned to you, there is a beautiful teaching that the ultimate sovereign of the world will not be a Chakravarti or a universal ruler. But the ultimate sovereign of the world will be the kingless authority of the law. What a beautiful phrase that is. The kingless authority of the law. That is, there is no physical person, but the law will be the ultimate sovereign of the entire world. Now, what a beautiful expression that is of international law and its function in society. So all the religions, all the teachings are on peace. But those who profess to follow these religions uh, and uh, the majority of the world would follow one or other of the religions I mentioned to you. But we have war everywhere. And uh, there's obviously some huge gap between the religious teaching and the practical activity. So what are we to do about it? Now, one thing uh, that we need to do is to correct the total ignorance that prevails in the world today about religions other than one's own. Unfortunately, we in all societies have this uh, terrible impediment that we grow up, we are taught a lot about our own religion, and we are sometimes steeped in it. That's fine. But we are not told a word about the other religions. And in consequence, that is terra incognita to us, we know nothing about it. 
we tend to uh, treat it with disrespect, not realizing that all the religions uh, teach basically the same principles. They come together in their teachings on all these great matters, the dignity of the human person, the unity of the human family, the protection of the environment, the rights of future generations, the importance of peace, the peaceful resolution of disputes, and so on. I could give you 25 major areas concerning the human future where all the religions come together in their teachings. And what is happening, we are totally unaware of this wealth of teaching in the other religions, which will reinforce the teaching of our own. Now, I don't, thank you, I don't want to, I'm not here dealing with the various, the various matters of dogma and ritual and so on. I'm, de I'm dealing with the general teachings of the religions. And all the religions, as I said, teach these same fundamental principles. Now, in uh, the world of international law, we, of course, <clears throat> like to reinforce the teachings of peace and our objectives of peace with some uh, knowledge of the traditions of different civilizations, different cultures, different religions. And in my years on the international court, <clears throat> I have tried my best to draw into the jurisprudence of international law the wisdom of various other cultures, which generally international law had not looked at because it so happened that international law as presently practiced or as practiced till the time I joined the court in 1990 was largely Eurocentric and monocultural. It was based, based largely on the European pattern and European ways of thought. And there was a general misbelief that international law was something that originated in Western civilization. Now, this is not true. There were, there were visions of international law from ancient Hindu times, 3,000 or 4,000 years ago, in the beautiful expression I gave you earlier, of the kingless authority of the law being the ultimate sovereign of the world. But you look at all the religions and you find that they have uh, teachings on relationships between states and between sovereigns. But who were the first writers on international law? Now, there is a common belief that Hugo Grotius, the Western jurist, he was a brilliant jurist, uh, who wrote in the, 13th, in the uh, 17th century during the Thirty Years' War. Now, I might tell you something about that. The Thirty Years' War, which raged from 1618 to 1648, was one of the most devastating wars that Europe had seen up to then. And it broke apart all the great overarching uh, uh, structures of authority that had existed in Europe, such as the Holy Roman Empire and the power of the papacy and so forth. <clears throat> and the result of that was that all these various states that would have been under the umbrella of the Holy Roman Empire or the papacy and so forth, and subject to their overarching sets of rules, would break away from that central authority at the end of the Thirty Years' War. And the result of that would be that a large number of new states would enter the world community, large states and small states, powerful states and states with no power at all, dukedoms and principalities and counties and so on, all becoming independent states. Now, the Dutch tourist Hugo Grotius, who was very far-seeing, realized that when this war came to an end, there would be a tremendous conflict between these new states, the big states trying to swallow up the small states, the small states being unable to protect themselves and so on. And he formulated a set of rules, uh, which he set forth in his book on War and Peace, which was published in 1625. That was a great work, published in the middle of the Thirty Years' War, and published in anticipation of the fact that so many states would break away from the old conglomerate authorities. 
And uh, in other words, he was writing a set of rules for the new states that were to emerge. And Grotius's book on war and peace of 1625 was generally thought to be the foundation and the beginning of modern international law. Now, that's what most people believed. <clears throat> there was a slight variation of that among the European jurists, some of whom said that a hundred years before Grotius, the Spanish jurists also formulated principles of international law. That was fine. But they all forgot the fact that 800 years before Hugo Grotius, the Islamic jurists, such as al Shebani, had written detailed texts, multi-volume texts, on what today you would call international law. What did they write on? They wrote on the same things that Grotius wrote on, the sanctity of treaties. Grotius, in his book on war and peace, makes that the sheet anchor of his system of international law. <clears throat> the sanctity of treaties. If two, two princes agree to a, a treaty, then they are bound by it and they must honor it to the very end. Well, the Islamic jurists said that more than 800 years before that. And they based it upon a Quranic statement <clears throat> that among you believers, Promises are sacred. If you make a promise, you must obey it to the very end. And if a promise was made sacred in that way, so also a promise between two rulers of states was also sacred, and that was a treaty. So the Islamic jurists then wrote, treat wrote treatises on that, uh, that proposition. Likewise, how do you treat a prisoner of war? Uh, Prophet Muhammad, to, uh, who has uh, about 4,000 of his statements and acts are uh, all recorded. And he had said, if you have a prisoner of war, treat that prisoner with respect, give him good food, give him good clothes. And he went so far as to say, and if he has a last will or correspondence, send it back to his home across the line of battle, which is in advance of the Geneva Conventions. And so that was then elaborated on by the Islamic jurists uh, to talk of the ways in which you treat prisoners of war. Uh, how do you treat foreign diplomats? There again, that was the tradition of Prophet Muhammad, that when foreign diplomats came to see him, he would don ceremonial robes and meet them in his own personal quarters. Now, that was elaborated on by the Islamic jurists to say that the emissaries of foreign sovereigns have to be treated with the greatest respect. Uh, so all those rules of modern international law were there in the Islamic treatises 800 years before Grotius wrote his book. And uh, of course, these ideas no doubt percolated through to the West. In fact, there was a king called King Alfonso X of Castile who wrote a wonderful encyclopedia on law. And uh, in that, he had sections on different departments of law. And he had a section on international law and all the scholars are agreed that that section on international law was taken or reflected very much the writings of the Islamic jurists with which he would have been familiar because he wrote in Spain. So there has always been this interchange between civilizations, between cultures, between religions, but we are taught nothing of that in school. And we go through life in complete ignorance of this. And this is why uh, there is misunderstanding, tension, and eventually resort to force. If we could only correct this by a process of education, we would take away one of the primary causes of international conflict. Now, in my own way, I have tried. Uh, I have a small uh, center in Sri Lanka, uh, which is called the Viramantri International Center for Peace Education and Research. Our deputy director is here, Neshan Gunasekara. And uh, now we try to get children of different uh, religious backgrounds, different you know, groups in the country, and put them together in a small camp for about three days. That is about 50 of them at a time. And we teach them about each other's backgrounds. And they emerge from that camp saying, we are friends for life. We do the same with undergraduates drawn from different universities 
in different parts of the country, 10 from each university. And after three days, the undergraduates say the same thing. We are friends for life. Now, if you can do that in a country on a massive scale, I think you completely alter the climate of opinion in that country. And you begin to generate a feeling of respect across all those barriers which traditionally divide people. And educationists will know much better how to set about this exercise. For example, in the graduate camps, one of the things we do is, as they assemble on the first day, we tell them, pair off immediately with somebody from a different group. And both of you get together and discuss each other's backgrounds in great detail. And why have you got to do this? Because at the end of the camp, you have to make a speech about my friend. So each one of them is under, uh, sort of under pressure to talk to the, his companion about you know, their respective backgrounds. And they find that they have so much in common. They come from different racial groups, different religions, different backgrounds entirely. But uh, they find that their mother is a wonderful cook, their grandmother is a great storyteller, their father is a good worker, etc., etc., and their ambitions and so on are also similar, that they come out feeling bonded. Now, we can do that, and we should do that on a massive scale wherever we can. Now, these are reasons why uh, we have got to try to eliminate the causes of war. And I have also been advocating that it is very important for us to uh, ensure that children in schools know something of international law. Now, when I say that, everybody smiles because they think that international law is a very esoteric discipline meant only for the specialists. That is not so. International law is based upon simple principles which all children understand. The principles of peace, peaceful resolution of disputes, respect for other people, other countries, protection of the environment, and so on. And the children are delighted when you tell them this. They are delighted and their eyes light up when they know that in this cynical world there is such a system as international law. Now, people tend to deride international law saying it has no teeth, it is not effective. And uh, that is the general impression you get about international law. In fact, they say that English lawyers would say uh, English law is law, foreign law is fact, international law is fiction. That's, that's one way in which they express, express their disdain for international law. But let me tell you how international law should work. I will give you one example, and the general public doesn't know this. In the International Court of Justice, we have disputes that come to us from so many different countries, and we give so many decisions, and the research indicates that over 90% of those decisions are obeyed by those countries, even though the International Court has no jurisdiction, no, no power to enforce its decrees. We do not have even one soldier. And how can we have an army that is bigger than the armies of the powers of the world? We do not have even one soldier. But just to give you one example, we had a case between Libya and Chad. Libya to the north, Chad to the south, a dispute about their common boundary. Libya said it was to the south, Chad said it was to the north, and the two parallel lines enclosed a considerable strip of land. Now, because of this dispute, Libya, which had a much more powerful army than Chad, in fact, there was no comparison between their military strengths, Libya marched its army into occupation of this Auzu Strip. Libya was in occupation. Chad came to the court. We went into the matter in great detail, and we held in favor of Chad. Now, the cynic would say, how ridiculous. Here is the court without one soldier at its command, ordering the powerful Libyan army to withdraw from the Auzu Strip. Well, that's what we did. And what happened? The two countries agreed on a date. They met on the site. The flag of Chad was ceremonially hoisted, and the Libyan army formally withdrew. Now, isn't that a tremendous victory for international law? And that is the way international law does function, and that is the way it should function. But it will not function in that way if powerful countries and those who can defy the will of the court 
do not obey international law. So we have got to generate a respect for international law everywhere, and especially in the powerful countries. And the media also have play a role in not giving the public a proper impression of all this, because on that occasion, the media might have devoted at the most half a line to this sensational fact of Libya withdrawing, whereas if Libya had flouted the order of the court, it would have been screaming headlines. Everybody in the world would have been told how bad Libya was. But when Libya was obeying international law and obeying it as a model so a member of the international community, well, Libya is a bad boy, Libya gets a bad press, and nobody wants to know. Now, this is the result of that is that people do not know that international law is a, fun a system that functions, functions effectively. In fact, all of us would not be here uh, together in this room, but for the smooth functioning of international law. We have come from so many countries, and international laws uh, have regulated the way in which we travel between the countries, the way the health regulations, the air transport or sea transport, it's all regulated that way. And the way we communicate with each other, the food that we eat, it comes here from across the seas. And it comes in so many different, uh, under so many different rules and principles of international law. So international law is a smoothly, fun is a functioning system which functions smoothly. And we have to, and can function even more smoothly if the general citizen is aware of this. And that is why uh, I carry on a campaign to have this uh, instruction in international law introduced into schools. Now that is the basic, uh, uh, a basic aspect of this entire problem. Now coming back to international law and peace, now Grotius wrote his book in 1625, but of course the wars continued over the centuries and then there were the Napoleon, Napoleonic Wars and then uh, the Napoleonic Wars caused much, much more havoc than any previous wars. And uh, the Napoleonic Wars ended in 1815. Now, the amount of devastation that had taken place was so great that the people of Europe and the people of the whole world began to think, can't we have a world without war? And they did their best to achieve uh, some sort of dialogue between the philosophers and the rulers to prevent wars in the future. And you will be interested to know that because of this legacy of the Napoleonic Wars, there were about 400 peace societies created throughout the world in the 19th century, all reading the works of the philosophers of peace. And uh, they studied the works of Rousseau and Bentham, who Bentham even suggested an international court of justice Rousseau also suggested a court that would sit in judgment over the nations. Then there was Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher. He wrote this very interesting thing. He said, when two sovereigns of the world wage war against each other, it is like you and I playing a game of chess. We are seated in the comfort of our chairs, all right? We move pieces on the, on the board, on the chess board. The sovereigns of the world are seated in their palaces. They are waited on hand and foot by their retainers. And then they give orders and their people fight on the battlefields. Of course, soldiers are killed and maimed and cities are destroyed. But these two sovereigns are immune from all that. They are living in the comfort of their palaces and waited on hand and foot by their retainers. And they go on waging this battle. And one sovereign wins and the other loses, like you're winning the game and my losing the game of chess. They then clear the board and start another game. So it's a good game for the sovereigns, but it's the poor people of the world who suffer, and they do not see this. So this was the sort of uh, peace society thinking that was very current in the world in, in uh, the 19th century after the Napoleonic Wars. <clears throat> then what happened? Uh, there, was, uh, there were people like Tolstoy and others who also wrote about peace. And the Tsar of Russia, Nicholas II, he was somewhat uh, under the influence of these philosophers. And there used to be a custom in the Russian court at St. Petersburg for the foreign ambassadors 
to be briefed once every two months or so by the Russian Foreign Office. So they would gather there and they would be briefed by the Russian Foreign Office on what it had done in the last couple of months. <clears throat> so the ambassadors were all assembled for this uh, briefing one day when, lo and behold, what they received was not a bulletin about the work of the Russian Foreign Office, but a letter personally signed by Tsar Nicholas addressed to their sovereigns, asking the sovereigns to assemble together to have a discussion on matters of peace, to assemble together to have a peace conference. And what he was saying in effect was, when you and I have a quarrel, we generally kill 10 or 20,000 of our best young men, and then we come to the conference table. Might it not be a most, more reasonable thing to come to the conference table first before doing the business of killing? And this, of course, seems reasonable to us, but it seems so unreasonable to the ambassadors at the time. They thought the Tsar was out of his mind. But because the Tsar had sent the letter, they had to send it to their respective sovereigns, and they had to answer respectfully. <clears throat> and they said, all right, we will come uh, to a meeting if you organize one. Then the question was, where do we organize it? Uh, and they said, everybody said, of course, not in a big city. So they said, let's have it in Geneva. That's the obvious place for it. And they were going to have it in Geneva when the, uh, when the em Empress of Austria, who was visiting Geneva, was assassinated by a madman. So everybody said, oh, Geneva is not safe. <laughs> and then the Queen of Holland, Wilhelmina, the young queen who had ascended the throne, she said, why don't you have it here? This is the land of Grotius. And so everybody agreed to that. And that is how the Hague came to be the place where the Great Peace Conference of 1899 was held. And thereafter, <coughs> after this peace conference, there was the permanent court of arbitration, which was set up to settle by arbitration disputes that might otherwise have gone to war. And so a number of wars were avoided. But they could not set up an international court of justice because the big powers would not want to surrender their sovereignty to a supranational court like this. <clears throat> so people uh, wait to be taught bitter lessons before they begin to see reason. So the whole world waited to be taught the bitter lesson of World War I. And after World War I, they met again, and then they saw a little more reason, and they thought we will have an international court. But there again, the big powers were not prepared to come to it. And there was tremendous argument going on uh, at Versailles when they were discussing the terms of peace. And uh, there is, I remember reading the speech of the Belgian delegate at the Versailles conference. The Belgian delegate said, we have met here to create a, uh, a peace for the world, to create an international court which will sit in judgment over the nations. That is what millions of our best young men have died for. We are betraying their memory. Just preserve silence in this room for a moment. I am not an orator like Demosthenes or Cicero, but bear with me. Preserve silence, and you will hear from that window the sound of wailing and mourning. What is that? That is the wailing and mourning of the wives and mothers of our young men who died to give us a better world. We are betraying their memory. Preserve silence for a moment again, and from the other window, you will hear the sound of wailing and mourning. What is that? That is the wailing and mourning of our bright young men who died to give us a better world. We are betraying their memory. And so as a result of eloquent speeches like this, eventually, they succeeded in setting up a permanent court of international justice, but with jurisdiction limited only to countries that had agreed to their jurisdiction. And after World War II, this was made an integral part of the United Nations, and that was the International Court of Justice, which I sat on. So in this way, the idea of international justice, which was formulated even 3,000 years ago in, by the ancient philosophers, gradually gathered mom momentum and achieved realization. Uh, so this was a great step forward, but international law needs to be developed, and it can only be developed if people have a better idea of it, and if the powerful states pay a better respect to it. And that is what we have got to work towards. And take, for example, the fact that there are nuclear weapons in this world. 
who on earth would think that a civilized community would have within and would be still be making and preserving weapons which could destroy the whole human race a thousand times over. But that is what we are doing. A visitor from outer space would think that we have taken leave of our senses. But that is what the majority of the, the bulk of the world's money is being devoted to developing instruments of war. There's something wrong somewhere. And we have got to find out the causes of it and prevent it. And let me tell you, when the International Court was asked by the General Assembly of the United Nations to, decide, to give an opinion uh, on the question of the legality of nuclear weapons, that was referred to by David in his speech, uh, when this, was, uh, this opinion was asked from us, that was the biggest case that the court ever heard because so many countries argued before us both for the weapon and against the weapon. And I remember one of the lawyers for uh, one of the anti-nuclear countries said this to us. He said, you know, the half-life of the byproducts of the nuclear weapon lasts for 24,000 years, the half-life that pollutes the atmosphere, the seas, the ground, and so on, for 24,000 years. Uh, now, uh, now, that is fact. And that's only the half-life. So we are polluting the Earth for 24,000 years for all the generations to come. So one, this lawyer said, if Stone Age man had had the power to do this in a manner which would affect us and affect our lifestyle, affect our atmosphere, affect our water, affect our health, what would we say? We would say, what barbarians, what savages, what brutes, but what better could you expect of them? Now that is precisely what we are doing to future generations. And we are doing it without batting an eyelid. There's something wrong somewhere with our civilization. So, and also, I was told by a friend today, I hadn't realized it, that hardly any language has existed for more than 10,000 years. Even if we are to put up a notice on that polluted site, saying, look, there is nuclear waste buried here, we have to have that notice there for 24,000 years. And there's what is the language in which you are going to keep uh, address it, uh, address that warning. And who, what guarantee do, do you have that your notice will be there for 24,000 years? But that is the irrational way in which we act. And even a school child can see this. And school children, when they are told all this, they say, well, everybody says nuclear weapons are bad. But still, there are people who keep nuclear weapons and make nuclear weapons. Obviously, somebody is lying. A boy of 10 once said that in a school exercise. It's obvious to a child, but not obvious to the rulers of this world. So I think what we need to do is to mount a tremendous campaign to show that the basic principles of all civilizations, all philosophies, all religions, is to achieve a peaceful world. And we have also got to think in terms of the rights of future generations. And that's what the World Future Council is particularly keen on, because Future generations are entitled to the earth and all its resources at least in the same way as we inherited it. We are betraying that trust. It is a trusteeship, not an ownership, uh, that gives us the right to use the resources of the world. We do so as custodians of these resources, and we have got to be true to that custody, true to that principle of trusteeship. And I have just written a book for the World Future Council on the five religions and what they teach on, on this matter of the environment and our duties towards it. And every one of them stresses that we have got to respect uh, the environment. Hinduism says uh, that when you get up in the morning and uh, you, there's a prayer that you should utter, asking the earth to forgive you for trampling on it. That is the amount of respect we have to pay to the environment which supports us. And all of this can be built up into a tremendous message, an inspirational message that can go through all the world, starting with the school children and going up all the way uh, to undergraduates, the members of the public, lawyers, and even judges, because I find that even some judges are not sufficiently aware of the basic principles of international law. So all of this is a set of ideas 
which I just wanted to communicate with you to show you how tremendous the responsibility is that lies upon us, uh, how tremendous the task that we have got to undertake, because for the first time you will realize the 20th century was a century of great hope. When, as uh, the Tsar had this conference in 1899, hoping that the 20th century would be a century of peace. We bungled it. But we have given another century, the 21st century, to put our house in order. That was a century of lost opportunity. This is our century of last opportunity. Because if we do not put our house in order in this century, there will be no human race surviving. So we have got to take on the responsibility of putting our house in order. This is our last opportunity to do so. We have a tremendous trust, res trusteeship responsibility towards the generations who are yet to come. As the Bible says, if you do not treat your children properly and you put obstacles before them, you might as well have a millstone around your neck and uh, be drowned in the lake or river. That is the fate that awaits those who neglect the interests of children and future generations. We cannot afford to be guilty of this and to have later generations pointing the finger of blame at us as people who have done nothing about it. So it is our duty to take this into our inner consciousness and take the message to all around us and take the message to the general public and take the message to the corridors of power and make a reality of the old human dream of a world of peace and justice. Thank you. same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave.